My focus of ministry this morning is upon our mission to the world. Last Sunday I spoke on the theme, our mission to our community, and now comes the balance to that. And at this church we have sought to have a ministry both to our community and to our world. And for some churches I recognize that that, that may be an either or thing. Some churches seem to specialize in perhaps ministering to their community and neglect the need of the world in terms of missions and say, well, why should we support missions? After all, we've got all kinds of missions to do right here. And then, of course, there are other churches who so stress missions that they've neglected to reach their own community. But the gospel that I know is a whole gospel. And Jesus says the Great Commission involves the totality of our existence. It begins right here. Go to Jerusalem, Judea, but then it expands to Samaria, or to Mexico, or to an Indian reservation, and then to the uttermost part of the world, to Kenya, or to Haiti, or to El Salvador. Go there as well. One of the things that the Old Testament tells us about the laws of sowing and reaping, which we're going to focus upon today, is that in that agrarian agriculture, or, or that agrarian community, farmers were taught not to harvest all the grain that was in their fields, but to leave the grain along the edges and the borders of their plots uncut so that the poor and needy might have something from it. And it seems to me a vital principle for the church as well, not to consume all of its resources upon itself, but to leave plenty standing for those who are in need of the gospel in this world. As a church, we're seeking to corporately demonstrate what we ask individuals to do on a personal basis. And I want to just share a little bit with you today from some laws of sowing and reaping. These five laws of sowing and reaping have to do with our personal life, and they're great for applying personally to what, how we're living, but they also relate to our focus as a church that is trying to have a world awareness, a church that's trying to encourage individuals to be not just local Christians, but world Christians. So I want to share with you those five laws. And I've had a joy this week of going through the scripture and looking up all the words that uh, involve the terms seed or reap or harvest or sowing. And uh, if we had about six hours or so, I could just take you through all of those. But I've tried to capsulize what the scriptures have to say in terms of five laws of sowing and reaping. The first one is so obvious, it's like falling off a log. And that is you reap what you sow. Galatians chapter 6 says, whatever a person sows, that will they also reap. That's certainly true in your personal life. It's certainly true if you're a farmer. If you plant uh, tomato seeds, cucumbers don't grow from them. As an individual, if in your closest relationships you are planting the seeds of encouragement and love and help, then that is what you're going to be reaping in your personal life. People coming back and loving you and helping you and encouraging you. But if you're planting seeds of criticism and negativity, then what you're going to be reaping is uh, uh, people not accepting you, people being critical of you and judgmental of you in return. We do reap what we have sown. It's true that in that law of reaping and sowing that there is an underlying assumption that you do not reap unless you sow. And when it comes to missions, obviously it is true that if we're not out there in the world sowing the gospel and being a witness, there will not be a harvest because the Lord has limited his power and his working according to principles of sowing and reaping. If a man is going to reap, if the church is going to reap, it must be at work in the world sowing. And obviously, as we look at world evangelism today and the state of the church in country after country, we will see a wide range of responsiveness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Earlier in the 8, 930 service, when we interviewed uh, uh, Ron Hittenberger in Haiti, we were hearing about a great increase in the church, the same in El Salvador. In other countries, the focus might be more upon the seed time rather than the harvest. 
But at whatever stage, from number one through number 10 of harvest time, we need to be at work in all those stages. Some of the missionaries that we're supporting are very much in seed time moments in ministry and in countries where there is not a great harvest going on. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't doing something because masses of people aren't being saved, but it's just that right now, that's the sowing time. It is not yet the harvest time. When I was in Guatemala in last November for, uh, to speak at the Central American Wycliffe Bible Translator Retreat, I had the pleasure of meeting a number of these Wycliffe translators on a personal level. One couple especially uh, I'm reminded of as I speak on the law of sowing and reaping. Their name is, uh, last name is Elliot. They've been missionaries in Guatemala for about 40 years. They were among the first Wycliffe Bible translators to go out and they chose to work in an Indian language which was the largest Indian language spoken in Guatemala. They had spent about a year and a half trying to learn this most difficult language. And by the way, the Elliot story has been written up in Reader's Digest and they were on the cover of Time magazine a couple of years ago when Time was doing a story on evangelical missions. The Elliots, with their babies, were out there living in a very primitive Indian village situation. And after about a year and a half, they had been getting no positive reception at all. The people didn't want them there. The, the people that were involved in uh, sat satanic uh, worship and, and witchcraft and the like were very opposed to their presence there. But they were trying to learn the language so they could give these people the most precious of all gifts, the gift of the Bible in their own tongue. They had not even after a year and a half, been able to learn the most fundamental word for love and for God. You see, that Indian group had all kinds of word for love and they had all kinds of words for God. And the Elliots had not yet heard the word for love or God that they knew matched what the Bible taught about love or about God. They were very frustrated. They were very discouraged. And in the midst of that discouraging moment, there came a letter from their home church, which was responsible for most of their support. And that letter from the pastor said, we have been reading a magazine, and they cited the magazine that came to them. And this uh, magazine was a Christian publication, was saying to pastors, missions committees, and churches, evaluate your support for missions. Here's what you should do. Write all the missionaries you're supporting and ask them how many souls they've won to the Lord in the last year. When you get all the responses back, then look at how many dollars you're giving to missions and allocate them by how much success these missionaries are having. That way you won't be supporting any dead weights out there. You'll be, just be supporting successful people who are really getting results. They hadn't been able to win anybody to the Lord in the last year, although they had witnessed, and they didn't even know the two most fundamental words of the Bible in that Indian language. They didn't know love and they didn't know God. And here they risk all their support being taken, which ultimately happened and God raised up other supporters. That church and that pastor simply didn't understand the principle that there are sowing times and it's not yet harvest time and we must be true to people in sowing times. If you go anywhere in Guatemala today, among that particular Indian group, you'll find believers. There are thousands of believers in that Indian group all over Guatemala who've come to faith, and the Elliots stood at the fountainhead of that movement to God because they were faithful in a seed time. But if you're going to reap, you've got to sow. You've got to be out there sowing. And that's what a missions awareness is all about, to say to us, if there's going to be a harvest in the kingdom of God, somebody's got to sow. The second law of sowing and reaping almost seems to be contradictory to the first. And that is this, you sometimes reap where you didn't sow, someone else has sown, and you reap. Jesus says in John chapter 4 to his disciples, I'm sending you out to reap what you did not plant. Others have sowed and you have reaped the harvest. How true it is in our individual life that what we benefit from so much in our life has been the product of others' labor and of others' investment and of others' prayers. I had a chance uh, some time ago to be in northeastern Ohio, and I was just within 50 miles of Cleveland, Ohio. And I so badly wanted to go to uh, find out where my mother's family lived. My mother was raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Her father, Oliver Weidman, raised eight kids to love the Lord. All but one of them served the Lord with faithfulness. I never met my grandfather, Oliver. He was gone before I was ever born. I wanted to visit that house. I wanted to pay my respects at his grave and thank a man I never met 
for a contribution he's made to my life because you see it was his zeal in prayer. It was his zeal in personal evangelism. It was his concern for his family that birthed a generation after him who served God with great strength. And today, all of, almost all of Oliver's grandkids are serving the Lord to the fourth generation. And I have reaped as an individual that which I did not sow, which my grandfather sowed in spirituality and in dedication to Christ. That principle of us reaping where we did not sow applies to this church as well. I mentioned in the 8 o'clock service at Elsie Chronic Wood, my stepmother was in that service. And her and her first husband, M.C. Chronic, came as young people to Costa Mesa in 1940 when there was 3,000 people in bean fields and gourd farms in this area. And they cashed in an insurance policy for $150 and bought an acre and third land on 22nd Street and for 30 years sowed and at the end of their ministry left behind a congregation of less than 200 people after 30 years. But had they not done what they did, the church as we know it today could not have come into being with the strength that has come. It is because someone sowed, and now we have a chance to reap. Paul says that truth, that some sow and others water, but it's God who gives the increase. And from time to time in our life, we need to just take a moment of thanksgiving and look around and thank the Lord for the people who've invested in our lives that we've reaped the benefit of their involvement and their labor. And then the third law of sowing and reaping is that uh, sometimes we sow, but we ourselves do not reap. Another reaps. We sow, but we ourselves may not reap. This, it seems to me, is kind of at the heart, the heart of an understanding of uh, what missions is all about because uh, we're concerned about people and about the world and the investment we make in missions is not something that we may ever see firsthand the results of. It's like when Martin Luther was asked what would happen if he knew that today was to be his last day on the earth. He said, well, I would go out and plant a tree if I knew that this was the end. What, what was his philosophy? His philosophy was, I must do something for someone else. I must pave the way for the next generation. Must, because there is a law of sowing and reaping, I choose to sow where I may not reap, but I know there will be a harvest, so I go ahead and sow. This last academic year, I was asked to lead one of the chapel services at the college, and it meets in this sanctuary. And uh, it was a communion service that I was asked to lead, and I thought, well, here in this uh, service are the future leaders of the church. And John and Kathy Mayo were just there a few years ago. I remember having John in class, and now they're getting ready to go as missionaries. And I thought, well, you know, one of the things that communion ought to do is not only draw us closer to the Lord and closer to one another, but communion ought to draw us closer to our responsibility and to a world awareness as Christians, a closer touch with the great commission of the Lord. Uh, so I had asked my daughter to help me, and she found some about 14 people, and at a prearranged moment in the service, they stood up one by one and had a part. And here was what I asked them to do. There comes a moment when the communion is distributed where the minister will sometimes say, is there anyone who has not been served. And that's, of course, so that everybody has a chance to participate in the event that the servers missed an individual or missed a row. Is there anyone who has not been served? And that's often when it's done sort of a formality of the meeting and it, and it goes by, because most of the time everybody has been served. That's why I don't use it too much. But some, once in a while, you just use it. Is there anyone here who has not been served? And so when I came to that moment in the communion service, I just very without tipping my hand as to what was going on, I said very distinctly, is there anyone here who has not been served? And from within the audience, one of the students rose up and said in a very loud voice, which I had requested them to do, they said, I represent the 100,000 Tibetan refugees in India, and we have not been served. And then a second person stood and said, I represent the 6,000 Hopi Indians of Arizona, and we have not been served. And a third person stood and said, I speak for the 850,000 university students in the German Federated Republic, and we have not been served. And another person said, I represent the Dinka of Sudan, 
There are 1,940,000 of us, and we have not been served. And so on they went through the list. In fact, there are hundreds of what is called hidden people groups that missionary strategists have noted uh, sociologically. That is, people that have not been penetrated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible's not in their language. Missionaries are not working them. They work in a cultural group in which there has not been a penetration of the gospel. Someone has to sow the seed so that there can be a harvest among these people, and that is the task of a mature church. Not all churches can do that. I, when I talked with Ron Hittenberger at 9.30, it struck me that, as he said, I asked him, how much does the average Haitian make? And he said, between $175 and $200 a, a year. And then I asked how many in the audience were making at that level, and very few. I don't think any hands went up. Maybe some kids are getting that much in allowance. But even some kids get more allowance than that. And obvious, it's obvious that the church in Haiti is not in a position to, to construct a worldwide missionary thrust. They do not have the, the, the economic power behind that to send representatives to go help these churches get on their feet in other countries. But God has blessed us in this country. We can do that. And so part of our Christian formation is to learn the vital principle of the harvest that it's okay to sow. It's right to sow and we must sow or we do not reap. Paul said this to the Corinthians in writing them in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He asked them to give to a fund to help the needy in Jerusalem, the needy saints. Very frankly says to them that they aren't going to receive the benefit from their giving that's going to go somewhere else. But that God is going to in turn multiply their seed. The fourth law of the harvest is not only we reap what we sow, sometimes we reap where we do not sow, sometimes we sow where we do not reap, but the fourth law of the harvest is that we reap more than we sow. I don't know how many of you have ever come, had a farming background, but I am sensible enough to know that you can put some seeds in your hand and if you get those in, a, in the right kind of soil, that'll, that'll grow a whole lot more than just those little itty bitty seeds in your hand. Life is filled with multiplication. We sow a little bit of love, we reap a lot of love. We sow a little bit of anger, we reap a lot of anger. Uh, we reap qualitatively and quantitatively more than we sow. I went down to the nursery yesterday and I got me a, a bulb. This is a gladiola bulb, right? This is a scrawny, scrunched up, wizened, piece of agriculture. This is downright ugly. I wish you could all see it close up. And who would believe that out of this bulb would grow beautiful red gladiolas? A whole bunch of them and a whole lot bigger than this ugly bulb. Why is this happening? Because we reap more than we sow. Paul compares our body, I think, to a gladiola bulb. When he says at death that it's placed into the ground, it's sown in dishonor, it's raised in honor. It's sown in, uh, in weakness, it's raised in strength. But it's, uh, it changes as it is sown. Jesus says that a, lest a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bears much fruit. It will change. And uh, so when we look, for example, at giving to the work of the Lord, we may invest something financial as a seed, but uh, it's going to come out as a fruit, as a harvest in people and in lives that are shaped. We sow material things, we may reap spiritual things because the Lord is making the harvest greater than the seed. And not only that, when we talk about the fact that we reap more than we sow, we reap more quantitatively. Jesus says some will gain 30-fold and some 60-fold and some 100-fold. There is always the fact that the scripture is telling us that if we, if we sow generously, we will reap generously. The fundamental law of farming at the seed time is don't be cheap with the seed because to the degree that you are generous with the seed, to that degree there will be a generous harvest. And I ask you, as I always ask you, to be generous with the work of the Lord and with missions, especially in an hour when the Church of Jesus Christ is so stretched with scandal, let us not be blind to the fact that there are legitimate ministers and missionaries and churches that are really doing the work of the kingdom. I think if I knew that I could invest some money and every four years have it double, I would want to make that kind of an investment. 
And when I know that through Assemblies of God missions today overseas, our church is doubling every four to six years, I think that's a valuable investment in the work of the Lord. We've prepared a brochure this morning that describes the nearly 100 plus, well, over 100 plus missionaries and missionary projects that this church supports. We want you to have this, to keep it in your Bible and to keep it somewhere personal to you so you can pray for these people and believe God to give them a great harvest. We believe that the harvest will be greater than the seed sown, but in order to have that harvest, we must sow generously. And then the fifth law of the harvest is this. We reap later than we sow. We reap later than we sow. We sow good character qualities as parents into our children, and we'll reap them down the road. We may have to wait a while to see them, but reap them we will. We reap later than we sow. I... I had, when I was a little kid, I planted a seed, and I watched every day. I kept thinking a full tree would grow out of that seed, and it just didn't happen. It had to develop in its own time space. We always reap later than we sow. Psalm 126, 6 says, He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Why would a person go out weeping? Because they're carrying precious seed. And they're taking what they could eat and what would benefit them, and instead they're investing it into the ground. They're planting it rather than eating it, and they're doing it because they know the harvest won't be right away, and they're having to let go what is precious to them now because the harvest is always later than the planting. But it is the person who believes in the harvest that plants the seed now, doesn't leave it up to somebody else, but plants it now. Del Tar, who spoke at our Winter Mission Sunday, shares a story of his experience in West Africa that has helped me understand this matter of you reap later than you sow and helped me also understand Psalm 126 about going out weeping and sowing. Dell reflects how he was brought up in, as a pastor's kid in Minnesota and, and North Dakota, and I know his folks. And uh, they were in farming communities, and he was familiar with, you know, as a kid, he'd go out and play on John Deere tractors and drive them and cases and Minneapolis Molines and those kinds of things may be familiar to some of you who've had a farming background. And, and uh, Del Tar says, you know, in all those years of being a preacher's kid in farming communities, he said, I never once saw a deacon go out to sow weeping. Who goes out to sow weeping? He said, I never understood that scripture until I was in West Africa. And having been in West Africa last year myself, I can appreciate Del's story. He talks about the great Sahel. The Sahel is the vast savanna range uh, that stretches across the whole of Africa from east to west, 4,000 miles in length, hundreds of miles wide, and it is just below the Sahara Desert. And gradually the Sahara, the Sahara is moving into the Sahel. The moisture is more and more receding every year so that more and more Sahara is in the Sahel. And the people that have lived in the Sahel are being gradually pushed further south. And there's been great famine all across the Sahel. I was in, uh, I mentioned when I came back from West Africa last fall that I was in a place called Jibu, which is on just about getting into the Sahara Desert uh, at the edge of the Sahel. Jibu is 200 miles north of Ouagadougou and 300 miles south of Timbuktu. I mean, it is really nowhere, but it is out there where people are eating from the famine relief trucks that have brought them food to keep them alive. Del Tar talks about being in that region of the world, Burkina Faso, which is formerly Upper Volta and, and, and that area in there. And he says the four rainy months of the year are uh, May and June, July and August. And the farmer has to sow and till and get his crop in those four months because that's the only months there's moisture. In fact, when I was in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso in August, uh, my cousin John Weidman, who was taking me there, was telling me how hot Ouagadougou is, that it's one of the hottest cities in the world, 130 degrees maybe upwards of that, up, up to that in the summertime. And the day we drove into Ouagadougou was early August, and it was about 65 degrees, and it was raining. And we got into this hotel, and uh, John and I checked in, and, and I, was, I had light clothes on because it was supposed to be hot in Africa. And uh, I, I looked all over that room for about 10 minutes trying to find the thermostat to turn the heat on. And I finally said to my cousin John, I said, John, where in the world is the thermostat? I've got to get the heat on. I'm freezing to death. And he, he, he thought it was so funny. I kid you not. He bent over double, laughing, laughing, laughing. He thought that was so funny that someone would try to find heat in a hotel in Ouagadougou. There is no heat in Ouagadougou. It was the coldest day of the year, 65 degrees. 
I have since harassed him no end about how he's told me all these years about he was suffering for Christ in Africa and I get there and I find they've got permanent air conditioning. But those are four wonderful months. If there's rain, crops grow. Deltar says that September, October are two of the most beautiful months in, in that part of the world because the granaries are full, people have something to eat, they grow sorghum and milo and they take the sorghum and I've seen them do this myself, grind it down into flour and make a kind of a paste that looks like yesterday's cream of wheat in terms of its consistency, it's sort of a gruel and they eat it twice a day, put it on a, on a green leaf of some kind and just sit there holding the leaf in their hand and the food and take their fingers and take the little balls of uh, yesterday's cream of wheat and put it in the sauce and pop it in their mouth and that's the main meal and it, and it evidently is real sticky glue paste like stuff it holds the insides together okay and it evidently is nutritious they eat two meals a day September October two meals a day about 10 o'clock after the early morning work is done and then after sunset to keep the the tummy warm during the night and then the granaries begin to recede and by December most everybody's down to one meal a day and indeed by January one family out of 50 is still eating two meals a day. All the rest are down to one. And by February, people are beginning to go out into the bush and get bark off trees. And this may sound strange to you, but I, my mother, who was a missionary in China, tells about in the, I remember her telling about in the mid-30s, the famine being so severe in the area of China she was that the bark of all the trees in the whole area for hundreds of miles was totally stripped clean because it was all people had to eat. And they would take the bark off the trees and boil it and use the residue for a kind of soup to hold the body together if possible. So they begin to do that and by March the babies in the nearby villages can be heard crying through the night air. Their tummies empty and their mother's milk stopped. April, Deltar says, is the worst month. It's a hot month. The air is just absolutely still. One hears no jet noises or the noise of autos or motorcycles or anything and there's just that hotness and the dirt that gets everywhere, the cracks of your skin, your mouth, your bed, everywhere, that dirt coming in from the Sahara. And then he says it inevitably happens sometime in the month of April, a six or a seven year old boy will come running into the village into his father's hut and say, Father, Father, I found some grain, we have grain, we can eat. And his father will look at him and say to him, you know, son, we've been out of grain for months. And the boy will say, no, no, we have grain. I was out in the shed where we keep the goats tied up at night and I reached my hand into a leather bag that was hanging up high there. I was playing, and, but I reached in there and I found grain. There's a whole bag full of grain. Tell mom to get it and cook and we can eat tonight. And his dad then sadly looks down at his young son and says to him, son, we cannot eat that grain. That is seed grain, and when the rains come in May, I must plant that grain. We cannot eat that. That farmer knows that they cannot eat seed because that seed will make their future harvests. And if they eat it today, it will only satisfy them for today, but their future is gone. So he must keep the seed. And Del Tar says, and as I was preaching in an 8 o'clock service, I looked down and saw Mel and Marita McNutt have also served as missionaries in that part of the world, and they were shaking their heads because they've seen the same thing out there. Many a time, Del says, I've gone out and I have seen farmers carry their precious sack of seed, their only seed, and as they go to sow it, there are tears coursing down their cheeks. Why are they weeping? It is because the grain which they could eat and could feed their family today is being lost in the ground. It's being buried. It's being made dead. Why are they sowing what is so precious? They're sowing it because they believe in the harvest. People don't sow a seed unless they believe in a harvest. They would eat it. And I think this is uh, such a marvelous example for us as well. We cannot, as Christians, keep all of our resources to ourselves. We have got to isolate and segregate out resources that are seed resources in the kingdom of God. They belong to the kingdom. It's not simply the leaveovers. It's not the scraps of our life, but it's also a dedication, a priority to take the first things that belong to God and reinvest them in his work. Why do we invest them? Because the Lord has told us, but also because we believe in a harvest. We believe there will come a day when the judge of all the earth will come and ask for us an account of our life and that he will gather the harvest home to him. We believe in the harvest. Therefore, we sow the seed today.
The harvest may come later, but today if we have seed, we must invest it in the master's work. May the Lord help us to know in our own personal lives that in regard to the kingdom of God, or in regard to any principle of life, that we will indeed reap what we sow, and if we sow generously, we will see a generous crop. We may not always reap what we sow, and we may not, and we may sow where we do not reap, but for sure, we will indeed see that we reap more than we sow, and will for sure reap later than we sow. Our Lord, as we have come to you today in this service, we have been challenged again to look at the world. And that may be difficult for some of us to do because our focus is so upon the immediate and the near to us. And yet, Lord, you laid this obligation upon us. It's not something I as pastor have cooked up for today or for an emphasis in the church. You, the commander-in-chief, have said to us, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to every creature. You've laid that on us, Lord. And to close our ears won't do, to ignore orders won't do. And yet to go out and do that without your heart, without the broken spirit that Ron Summers has talked to us about isn't any good either. We want to have your heart for the world and have your heart for the people that are nearest us in life as well. All of our life, Lord, is an investment. We're laying seed all the time. Help us, Lord, to keep faithful at investing in your work and in your people that we might see a liberal harvest through Christ our Lord. Amen.